as we gather uh, as a community, as a virtual community, um, we are each of us sitting, standing, lying down on the earth, um, our mother. And it's, it's helpful, it's a, it's a kind of um, sacred ritual as we feel ourselves embodied as an earthling, as a part of this earth, as a, a child of this earth, a, uh, a sprout of this earth. that we bring to mind the ancestors, those who have inhabited this earth, both human and non-human. As an act of respect and acknowledgement, we bring to mind are the indigenous ancestors, each one in uh, wherever you are located. <clears throat> Bringing to heart and mind how the unfolding of the our presence, each one of us in our own lineage, how that came to pass, um, bringing a sense of perhaps um, sorrow, compassion, and remorse, remorse as a healthy uh, acknowledgement of harm done to the violence with which settlers came, immigrants came to this land here in Montreal, um, known in the Kanyankahaga language as uh, Chachaga, uh, a meeting place, a place where the waters uh, converged and brought many peoples. And many peoples over the last centuries. Many of whom were looking for freedom from oppression, for new opportunities, from places of famine and uh, persecution, many of whom came not seeing the civilizations and uh, cultures that were already here, not respecting, perhaps bringing that experience of not having been respected, of having been persecuted, of having been oppressed, and transmitting it onto those who were already here. So acknowledging this, um, this harm and bringing an intention for reconciliation. And reconciliation begins with remembering and, uh, and acknowledging and honoring that which has happened, that which has transpired, and, um, and repairing what needs to be repaired. And how do we do that? I think it's something that we need to contemplate, we need to reflect on, to do it with a sense of 
Um, an intention to heal uh, doesn't need to be done with a sense of shame or a sense of guilt. In fact, that is counterproductive, but the, the honest, clear-eyed acknowledgement uh, and in whatever ways we can, uh, joining together with those who who are trying to repair this world. And it begins, it begins here. It begins with this being right here, looking at where do we hold blame, ill will, resentment, self-blame. And, uh, and that's something that we're going to explore today in as we continue to look at the hindrances in our exploration of the Satipatthana Sutta, we continue to look at the hindrances and, and today looking at ill will. So let's begin by grounding ourselves in, um, in the, the precepts in contemplation of the precepts, the commitments to non-harming. And so please uh, join with me in whatever way feels right for you. It could be by uh, listening or reading the English or chanting with me. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhamang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Damang Saranang Gachami Dutiyampi Sangam Saranang Gachami Tati ampi budang sarnang gachami. Tati ampi damang sarnang gachami. Tati ampi sangang sarnang gachami. And so now let's reflect and, and collect the mind with the, an intention toward non-harming. So non-harming includes acts of goodness, acts of virtue, because in the Buddhist teaching, it's when we let go of the habits that are harmful to ourselves and others, that the heart, which is naturally open, aware, connected, which implies kind and generous, 
the heart can express itself unimpeded by these obstructions, uh, which are so habitually ingrained in our being. And so, and so in the Buddhist teachers, it, teachings, it's, it's, it's actually uh, in seeing these and, and letting go of them, uh, removing their grip on us, relaxing the habitual way that we hold these habits of mind. And in that openness, there is a natural sense of connection, interconnection, uh, which is the foundation of love, the foundation of goodness, the foundation of virtuous acts. And so, and so by, by recognizing uh, the harm, we allow these uh, energies of generosity and and supporting life and uh, speaking the truth and and cultivating a skillful erotic uh, sensitivity to let the life around us all of this um, can blossom when uh, when our ethical precepts are in place. So, so you, you, we can invite a reflection on what are the positive iterations of each of these expressions of resolve to stop ourselves from causing harm. Panati pata. Veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Adinadana veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Kamesu michachara veramani Sikapadam samadhiya ami. Musawada veramani sikapadam samadhiya ami. Sura Maria Maja Pamadatana veramani sikapadam samadhiya me. Ida misila maga fala nyanasa pachayo hotu. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Anu modami. May this training in peaceful conduct help to bring about the knowledge of the path and the fruits of liberation. So the knowledge of the path, what does that mean to you? The knowledge of the path. How do we cultivate? How do we come to know the path? So in my understanding, we come to know the path by hearing, by reading, by learning the Dharma, and by then remembering it in our own life, moment by moment, and applying it, and then realizing the freedom, liberation. Just 
just um, adjusting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, um, so this knowledge of the path is something that we we develop through our walking the path. And, and it's something that unfolds as we walk the path. You know, like walking the path is when, when we're walking a path in the world, uh, we may not see the whole path, but we can see ahead, usually a little bit. Uh, and, and sometimes in walking the Dharma path, we can see, we can see ahead a little bit, but mostly it's moment by moment, step by step. Um, in the development of sati, mindfulness, we develop the capacity to, to bring this inner awareness, the awareness of our moment by moment inner experience in the body, in the heart, the chitta, in the mind, the thoughts, the, the, uh, the formations, the mental formations, the manos, the, these, uh, these dhammas of, of structures that, that, um, that we, we have many of them through habit, many of them that we have cultivated, that we have intentionally developed. So, uh, um, and, uh, and as we walk the path, we're intentionally developing skillful dhammas, skillful formations of mind. So, these habits of mind that have uh, that we see as 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 mindfulness develops and um, and 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 we see uh, perhaps thoughts, impulses, um, imaginations, um, emotional states arising. Where do they come from? You know, how, how, how did they get there? You know, sometimes these thoughts come up and, and we, you know, and we like right now in, in terms of who, how we understand ourselves in our lives and, and how we understand ourselves in the world. And we, and, and we some, sometimes we may think, oh, that, that feels so alien. And, and especially today we're talking, we're focusing on ill will, the second of the hindrances. So last week we, we, uh, we talked about sense desire, the grasping, the wanting. And, and, and this reflection applies also to sense desire. So some, some of the, the sense desires come you know, from bodily function, you know, sexual arousal, um, uh, hunger, um, imaginations. Sometimes we see something and then we want it. We want to eat it. We want to grab it. We want to own it. So, so sense desire is, can be very immediate. Ill will also can be something annoys us, irritates us in, in the, in the moment, uh, a sound, a, uh, somebody says something, something, comes up into our mind or into our sense spheres uh, that is displeasing, that is unpleasant. And then the, when sati is not present, then, you know, there's, there's this ar arising of, of dislike, of wanting it to go away, wanting it to disappear, wanting to get rid of it. And, um, and so, so that is part of how 
uh, ill will arises. And today I'm going to reflect on another way of, you know, as I mentioned last week, we're looking at the conditionality in these, in this uh, fourth Satipatthana. We're looking as the, as the, um, as the hindrance arise, whether it's one of the five hindrances or, or another afflictive emotion such as jealousy or, um, uh, or pride or self. I mean, all of these can be fit into the five hindrances, but um, it's good to have a wide vocabulary of, of these afflictive emotions that come up. Um, so self, self-loathing, self-judgment, you know, all of these. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think that we're being asked in our world, in our culture, to bring awareness to is how our perceptions have been shaped. Um, so if we are in a, a group of people that has been uh, privileged with a, a place of dominance in our society, if, if our skin is, is light colored, if uh, we've been brought, born into um, a, uh, a position of relative uh, abundance, good fortune, we have access to, uh, to education, to um, uh, we're not marginalized in different ways in mass media, in, in literature, in, uh, uh, in, in education, our, our cultures haven't been uh, erased. Uh, from history, all of these uh, ways in which um, perhaps many of us have been privileged. And even those who have experienced depression in different ways, uh, the mind has been conditioned to exclude certain kinds of people from those we consider to be like us, those we consider to be safe, acceptable, um, kin, kindred. And as we and this, this exclusion, this marginalization, this othering really, it's something that we carry with us in a way we carry the collective harm, the collective trauma of the world in our bodies, in our minds, in our hearts. We've been afflicted. What it, wherever we are, wherever we are, and 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 those who have uh, roots in um, in cultures, in ethnicities, and in, in in perhaps in personal histories, where where trauma has been very much a part of the formation of who we are. And there's so much diversity. So this is an, an, an variation in how this comes to pass. So this is, this is not a comparison of who's been victimized more than another. But this is an owning that we carry the world within our hearts, within our minds, within our bodies. We carry the 
the ways that our perceptions have been shaped to, to exclude, to other, to make less than human, less than um, our, our family. We are all family. We are all family. And so in this discourse, in this work, we're being asked to, you know, and, and I'm, I'm choosing to focus on that in this, uh, in this particular section on ill will. How does this arise within us to notice this? And I, I'm, I'm in encouraging you, inviting you to do this difficult work of noticing where is the arising of ill will in any moment, in any moment of your life. Where do you feel threatened when there's actually no threat, when the mind projects a threat because of conditioning, because of perceptions? You know, if you see a person who you label as black or a certain ethnicity, that is not uh, how you identify? Do you, does something arise within you? Or, or if you see somebody who's poor, who's homeless, who smells, who looks like they haven't showered in weeks, smells like that, who's begging on the street, sitting on the sidewalk. What arises in you? Does something arise in you? What are these conditionings? What are these perceptions? What are these otherings in which we we violate our common humanity. So it takes an intention, it takes courage to look at this. And one of the things that is really, I think, an obstacle to looking at these ways that we exclude and other and, uh, and harbor ill will, harbor perceptions, biases that separate us from whatever, certain kinds of people that, that we somehow don't fully include as, um, as, as our human family, uh, as our brother, our sister, our, our sibling, sibling, we're all siblings in aging, illness and death, the Buddha says this. So somehow we're separated and, and so, so we personalize it, we feel ashamed we feel guilty, we feel like, oh, this is bad. And in so many ways, we, we've, I've, I've mentioned this over the course of our, of our years together in, in terms of practice, that this kind of personalizing and identifying with the, um, with the hindrance, with the delusion, with the afflictive emotion that it's, it's most unhelpful. 
And in this particular way, the way that we, the other people that we see is not like us. I think it's really important that we, we affirm how we are carrying, that we are carrying the collective trauma of the world, of human history, the wars, the, the racism, the enslavement of different peoples, the oppression, the religious wars, uh, the misogyny, the patriarchy, the, the institutionalized greed of capitalism run amok. That we, we've absorbed this. We've, it's, it's not something that we've studied. It's not something that we've said yes to. It's, we've, we've absorbed it with the air we breathe, with, with how we've been educated, with all the media that's around us, with, in different ways, by our upbringing, you know, however we've been brought up, you know, many, perhaps some of you have been brought up with a, you know, more sense of intentional goodwill, um, recognizing all beings as, as part of the web of life, part of who we are. Um, I'd say many, many of us have not been brought up with those values. And so it's really, so this work is so important. It's so important for our own freedom. It's so important for our own peace, happiness, well-being and liberation. And it's so important for the liberation of all beings. It's so true that our liberation is bound up with the liberation of all beings. That as we, as we walk this path step by step, as we make those moment by moment choices to turn toward ill will, to turn toward delusion and, and recognize it, see the conditions which gave rise to us, to it, recognize it as not me, not mine, see the suffering that it engenders in ourselves and in others, and allow it to move through us, allow it to be let go. And then in that space of openness, when we have let go of the automatic, of the ingrained, of the habitual reactivity, the contraction, when we recognize it, when we see the harm, see the suffering, see the not self and the impermanence of it, and then just breathe into that openness, into that space, bringing forth, cultivating connection, love, compassion. And that, that is something that we do not just for ourselves, but for all beings. A simple act of acknowledging this, this is the effect of collective trauma. 
This is the harm of institutionalized racism, institutionalized classism, institutionalized patriarchy. All of these systemic attitudes which keep down certain parts of our communities that simple act of acknowledging how it lives in us and and letting it go it's actually it's painful to recognize especially if it's something that we're just beginning you know perhaps some of you have been on this journey for a while but as as we begin to recognize how deeply these things are ingrained within us, how they, how they arise before thought. I mean, they're just there. And, and to simply say with compassion, you know, this is not me, this is not mine. This is not myself. This is this is the, the suffering of the world that I'm carrying within me. Uh, and recognizing how diminishing it is, how, how isolating it is. Letting it go. Opening to metta, to love, to connection compassion for ourselves and all who have been harmed by these deep traumatizing uh, forces arising from delusion, arising from suffering, arising from ignorance, So I invite you to, um, as we move into practice, to perhaps be particularly sensitive to how ill will is arising, aversion, <coughs> excuse me, uh, could be toward yourself. That is also deeply ingrained um, attitude that that is part of the collective trauma. Uh, this these attitudes of perfectionism, these attitudes of of needing to perform, needing to um, to attune ourselves to how we imagine others are projecting their judgments on us. You know, all of these just are so uh, obstructive to the clarity and presence of mind. All of these are so obstructive to the capacity to, to just come home to ourselves, to live abiding, resting, in the chitta and the heart mind that feels at ease, at peace, at rest in itself. In the expansiveness and the openness of the natural quality of mind. Now this is this is our journey to being truly, truly at home. In, in honesty, in, in love and in kindness, in openness and acceptance of what is. And, and so just noticing as we move into meditation, 
What is that energy of ill will, of aversion, however you might name it, um, of othering, of condemning, How do we do that? And, and not at all to be overlooked of how we do it to ourselves. Um, and bringing gentleness and compassion, always, always. Um, seeing the dukkha of that. And, and saying to ourselves in whatever, whatever way you can, oh dear, sweet, Dear sweet one, um, how this how this is painful, how this causes suffering to you. And in the seeing of that dukkha, that it helps us to release because really at our heart at our deepest heart. We don't want ourselves to suffer. We don't want to suffer. At our deepest heart, we want to be free of suffering. However strong that energy of aggression or anger toward ourselves or others might be, So let's take a posture for meditation, uh, taking a moment if you need to, to stretch or to uh, just move a little bit. As you take your posture, honoring, respecting the body, sometimes taking a posture for meditation is described as uh, finding a comportment of the body that embodies dignity. So what, however that, that is for you, and feeling a sense of balance in the body, a sense of energy arising through the spine. Bringing gratitude for this body. Whatever the perhaps imperfect state of health we might find the body is living. And yet here we are, here we are healthy enough to, to be here, to feel the body, feel the breath, feel the connection of the body on the earth.
you might be anchoring your attention to the rising and falling of the breath. Connecting awareness with the in-breath and the out-breath. However the breath is manifesting in the body, not trying to perfect or change the breath in any way. Or you may find that just anchoring the attention to touch points of the body, connecting with the chair or the cushion or the, the bed, wherever you are. is a helpful anchor or could even be a, an anchor in the visual field. And bringing the attention back to this anchor as needed, as the mind drifts off, getting caught up. Enough to stabilize the mind. In order to bring consistent mindfulness. To our moment by moment experience. And in this case, we are bringing mindfulness to the arising of dhammas, formations, and in particular, the hindrances and and specifically ill will. Not, not limiting uh, our moment by moment mindfulness to practice to this, um, to noticing this, you know, working with this, but, but in particular, um, a particular lens that is aware of this hindrance, this hindrance of ill will, bias, judgment, exclusion, aversion, pushing away, othering, and so on. Including the othering of ourselves. And as the mind settles, finding a sense of rest, resting in awareness, abiding in this quality of knowing. presence, there may be a quality of luminosity, 
of stillness, of spaciousness. So the instruction is not to go looking for ill will. The practice is to be present and and rest to our capacity in sati and mindfulness and awareness. And noticing as the mind gets pulled into ill will, aversion, and other hindrances or states. And as this unfolds to courageously and compassionately work with these mindfully, bring mindfulness, investigation, energy to the practice of seeing the arising, seeing the nature of dukkha and seeing the passing away seeing the not self.
As you come back in your meditation, every time the mind gets caught up, come back to the body, feeling the whole body, feeling the breath in the body, noticing where the body's contracted, noticing if the breath has become agitated, noticing if the shoulders have become tight. Once again, invite the body to relax, to rest, to be open. So we come to the end of the practice. Let's gather together the blessings, the goodness of our practice, dedicating the merit, dedicating the goodness to all beings and to particular beings that come 
into the sphere of your awareness, into the field of awareness. I invite you to bring into this field of awareness those that in whatever way we do, we other, we exclude, we consider undeserving of our blessings, of our well wishes, those who have different political views perhaps, or act in different ways, or believe in ways that we consider wrong. And yet we can bring an intention to heal these schisms, these great gulfs and separations in our communities by remembering, acknowledging and honoring that we are all, all, all human beings, all life forms, siblings, in aging, illness, and death. And we can wish suffering, freedom from suffering, and, and a engagement and an insight into the way to become freedom, free from suffering. the causes of suffering may be released. May our practice and all of the ways that we bring goodness, love, kindness, compassion into our lives May the goodness of this, the merit, serve and support the happiness, well-being and liberation of all beings. <laughs>